and welcome once yes, again. Yes, it's clear enough. Excellent. So, uh, welcome once again to uh, one of the um, webinar series for, for the um, it's good. BIM Africa group. And I was asked to give this presentation about um, you know coding and the AEC professional. And I think it came about because we were having some conversations on our WhatsApp group, and some of us who were you know into coding started talking about its benefits, and some people got scared and worried. And there was a lot of personal messages to me to clarify why should anybody in the built environment ever want to learn how to code. So I said, okay, you know what, let's just make this a, a webinar or something like that so that we can share um, the learning and the benefits with everyone, okay, rather than you know, replying to um, individual uh, messages. So this presentation is just kind of titled, it's a bit long, why and how AEC professionals should learn coding and its benefits for digital transformation. Obviously, we all know there's a lot of talk about digital transformation, digital construction, build information modeling. So this is just one way of trying to say, where does coding fit in with all these changes that are happening around us? Well, you all, most of you will know me, I guess. I'm Dr. Zulfikar Adamu. I am an associate professor of strategic IT and construction. And I just want to start by telling you a little bit about myself. That's my not too handsome face over there. Um, surprise, surprise, I actually trained as an architect. I have two degrees in architecture, as a matter of fact. You know how it is back home in Nigeria. You have to get your master's before you are allowed to go near um, trying to open an, a firm or whatever on your own, write your professional exam. So I, I got my master's degree, but as soon as I got that degree, I, I, I just knew, you know what? By the time I was graduating, I got bored to that with the aesthetics and the function, follow form. It was kind of, um, it was interesting, but I needed more challenge, you know? So I, 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 I decided, you know what? I don't want to be a normal architect. I want to do something a little bit different. So I, I, I went to um, do a further MSc degree in architecture engineering because Engineering was the next line that I could really follow. It was logical to go from architecture into engineering. And in the process of doing an MSc in architecture engineering, I fell in love with computing and, and, and what lies beneath, you know, how we use computers from AutoCAD to 3D modeling. What makes this thing work? Why is it these computers are able to create these lines and rendering and animations? What happens underneath, you know? And there about, I, 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 I pursued a PhD in civil and building engineering at Loughborough University. And, and then since then, my career has more or less just stuck with the computing and IT side of things. But presently, I am an associate professor, like I said earlier, of strategic IT and construction at London South Bank University. And um, I'm also a sort of BIM 360 champion in the academic sector. I work very well closely with Autodex to uh, you know, promote the use of their new line of products called BIM 360 in, um, um, you know, because the industry is, um, you know, really moving towards cloud-based collaboration right now, you know, and I just decided to stay in academia, even though there are many opportunities for me to go to industry to do consulting work. The academia gives that kind of flexibility to experiment, to try new things without having to worry about client deadlines and all those sort of things. Um, I'm also happy, I also happen to be a, a judge at the uh, Autodex AEC Excellence Award. I was there last year and I was invited again this year to be a judge in, uh, in evaluating entries from different countries around the world. People are sending in uh, entries for design and construction categories. So for those of you that don't know, please Google AEC Excellence Award. And if you're working in a firm and you use technology like Beam and the rest of that, I'm sure you might find it helpful to put in an entry. You might win something either as, a, as, a, as a global prize or a regional prize or something like that. So overall, I think I'm a nice guy. I'm a poet at heart and I'm an artist down to the soul. And this is just the little I want to say about myself. So let's move on quickly to the Heart of the matter, why are we here today? We want to talk about coding and the AEC professional. And by AEC, of course, I mean architecture, engineering, and construction. So I, I put this agenda just to kind of um, lay out my plan for today's presentation. First of all, I will start with an overview of what, I, what is called um, object-oriented programming. This is really important. I'll be talking about coding in general, but I want to talk about object-oriented programming because I think it will help demystify what the software industry is doing and how that may relate to the construction industry in, in general. So the second part is, why would anyone want to learn to code? And I want to talk about coding being compared to things like accounting or English, like an analogy so you can understand what the different schools of thought about whether you need to learn coding or not. And, and the power of domain knowledge, because domain knowledge is very, very important in, 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 in coding. What it means is uh, a doctor, for example, has domain knowledge. Uh, a pharmacist has domain knowledge of pharmaceutical stuff. An architect has domain knowledge of design and construction. And, and that's really important in, in, in coding. And what you can do also with different levels of coding, I'll go into that and, and, and you hopefully understand why coding is therefore at the heart of the digital transformation that is taking place in almost every country in the world. And then the third part is where I talk about how should you learn to code then. So if you understand that um, 
you know, coding can be important. How do you go about learning it? Which language do you learn? I mean, uh, how hard is it? Do you go self-taught approach? I, I learned to code my, by myself. No one taught me. In the early 2000s, there was barely internet then. There was no such thing as broadband, so there was not like YouTube to help you. You had to actually write a check and send it to Amazon. They send you a book, and you had to learn it on your own. And even the online resources were like formal documentation of software and coding and all that kind of stuff. It was really difficult. But nowadays, you just go to YouTube and you can find anything you want. But then there's also the classroom approach that you can use. So I'll talk about these three different approaches to how you go about your journey if you want to go into coding of some sort. But there's something very important also that I've learned in my own personal experience about coding. There's something called the Pareto Principle to filter what it is you need to focus on. You don't just start learning everything. What do you have to focus on and what do you add on later on? And then there's something about project-based learning and the deep, how you avoid it. And finally, there will be lifelong learning because just like any other thing, any other skill or knowledge, you have to keep learning in order to stay relevant. And the last part of my presentation will just be question and answer. So hopefully, I hope to finish this presentation in about an hour or a bit earlier than that. And then we'll take some questions and answers from the um, listeners. And if I am kind of drifting away or it's not clear or um, my connection cuts off, I would be appreciated if someone was to tell me that something is wrong, you know? I think the organizers of BIM Africa will be happy to do that. So let's get on to the business of the day. An overview of uh, coding, or, or it, sorry, of object-oriented programming, OOP. Now, we know computers are very important in today's world, okay? But in, in terms of the built environment, we need to understand that um, the early concept of computer modeling uh, was basically based on trying to create CAD as a way of automating the manual drafting that we used to do. And, and the problem with manual drafting is that it's problematic. It can be inaccurate sometimes because of human error, you know, and, and, and generally it has been regarded as uh, one of the main problems of construction being that drawings tend to be ambiguous. They can be incomplete. They are full of inaccuracies. In fact, one drawing itself is almost useless, really. Think about it. A floor plan does not make sense without an elevation. An elevation probably is not very useful without a section. Even if you have a section, you still need some specifications. If you have specifications, you still need a bill of quantities. So the way we've developed as an industry um, is based on the drawing mode of doing things. Um, and, and the whole point of drawing is to pass information from one professional to the next and from all the professionals to the builders on site. So when you have a lot of all these inaccuracies and dependencies between different drawings, you tend to have all these challenges of ambiguity, incompleteness, and inaccuracies. So by going towards CAD, we were trying to solve that problem by making the, the drawings a bit more accurate. And so computers had the potential to solve some of these problems uh, that we face in the industry, and the seeds were, were, were sown in the late 1950s and, and 1960s. In fact, there's a fellow called uh, Ivan Sutherland who developed something called the Sketchpad as part of his PhD thesis at MIT in 1960s. And basically, look at that screen, uh, image there, you know? Does it remind you of anything? It's just a screen with a, with a stylus or a touch pen. And essentially, what his Sketchpad did was just allow software designers to interact graphically with a computer using a light pen to draw on the monitor. We call these things tablets today, it's an iPad, but hey, this has been around since the 1960s. Just because someone compressed it into a small device that you can use on your lap or whatever, it doesn't change the basic principle, okay? So just to make you understand that um, we've been interested in computing for quite a long time as an industry. So um, there's a fellow called Charles, Charles, Chuck Eastman, Charles Eastman, and um, in 1975, he developed something called the Building Description System, okay? Some of you might recognize Chuck Eastman as some people call him the godfather of BIM because he writes this BIM handbook thing. He's a very, very uh, uh, famous person, all right? And basically, his building description system that he developed was based on using something called parametric, parametric objects and models, which were used to extract 2D drawings of buildings. What is parametric? It means from parameters. Everything has a parameter, okay? So you can extract those parameters from drawings of buildings. And um, essentially, this was the concept where you have, for example, a cube, but if that cube is represented by what? Maybe edges and, 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 and vertices at, and edges. And if you can represent that, those edges and vertices, you can get faces and extrude them, which means you can represent a wall, a window, or any other object that you wanted to, to uh, represent. But all these things have to do with mathematical concepts and models, which is why programming was, is very important. You can't have graphics or models or whatever without uh, coding behind it at the end of the day. But this was the early attempt by one of us, uh, a built environment person, to kind of create a computerized way of developing 3D models, okay? As far back as 1975. Now, and that BDS process that Charles Eastman developed required having a single database. Those of you who know BIM know that BIM is dependent on a database for visual and quantitative analysis. Sounds very familiar to what people are trying to do nowadays in BIM, isn't it? Now, 
It was also intended that these BDS were used by contractors. And those contractors who used all this information for scheduling and placing orders for building materials based on those parameters. For example, if you know a wall is going to be this volume or this height or this, or be this materials, then you can make an order for that. Sounds like sort of things we're actually doing today in BIM, isn't it? But we kind of lost uh, touch with this concept. You know, we dropped the ball because since 1975, you know, we didn't really take advantage of this idea that Charles Eastman uh, uh, brought into the industry. But essentially what he was describing is what some of us would call building information modeling. And this was like seven years before Autodesk was even invented as a company and 25 years before Revit was even released. So some of the things that you might see around that might sound interesting or familiar or wonderful or, you know, or, or revolutionary, the seeds were, true, were, were sown maybe a, a long, long time ago. You know, some people say as things change, they tend to remain the same. So anyway, um, so where does this leave us with object-oriented programming and modeling? Well, this parametric representation that Charles Eastman was talking about uh, was helped by coding languages, because if you want to present, you know, those vertices I showed you earlier, you have to use coding to present the vertices of a building or a component or whatever it is, or to quantify the material. And we needed new coding languages because the existing languages that people were using to write software in those days could not handle that way of thinking. So those early, the new languages that came about were things like C++. Some of you may have heard about this. And later on, um, object-oriented programming started in 1960s with, um, and C++ itself was an early OOP programming and it came about from around 1979. And then something like C Sharp was a modern version of C++, which was created by Microsoft and is also used by Autodesk a lot. And I think it came about from the early 2000s. It's not too different from Java. Java is just uh, another form of C Sharp, in my opinion. Or rather, C Sharp is just another form of Java, if you want to put it that way, because Java has uh, been older than um, C Sharp by, 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 by a few years, you know. Um, so, but if you think about it, object-oriented programming is like trying to assemble computer code like the way you assemble Lego. Get parts that can say something, that can do specialized tasks, bring them together, and then assemble them and make uh, a software, okay? Now, let me explain why this is important. Previously, we used to have structured programming, where, for example, with the card system that Sutherland created, you could have a line, you could have an arc, you could have a text, and for all these lines, arc, and text that you present in your with code, you can move them, you can rotate them, you can scale them, but these are all individual lines and arcs and text. At the end of the day, a design is not based on line, arcs and text. All those lines, arcs and text actually represent things on the right hand side, you can see they're objects. If you think about a drawing, when you draw a line, it's, it doesn't say anything, you have to double that line or in those who do AutoCAD will tell you, you have to offset that line. If you offset the line, you have to block the edges of that line and then you can call it a wall. But remember, you are the one calling it a wall. The line didn't say it's a wall. You just made it a rectangle. So, but with object-oriented program, you're not just drawing those lines like you would do on the left-hand side with structure programming. You're actually creating that rectangle and you're telling it you are a wall and I can move you, I can rotate you, I can scale you. Similarly, you can create another object and say you are a slab. Those of you who do Revit or 3DB modeling will understand what I'm talking about. When you create a window or a door, you drag it and drop it. That object knows what it is because it's not just lines anymore. It's an object. It has properties, you know, the parameters, it has length, it has height, it has texture. It knows that it was manufactured by this company or this organization. This is this U value and all those sort of things. So that was the whole concept of object training program is that to represent real world objects with their properties, with their features. Okay. So that, that's very important. And you know what? If you think about the concept of object program, it's all about creating templates and architects will relate to this very well. The whole point is that if you know that you're going to create a wall, or in this case, let's say a, a car, you can create a class like a template. I want to create a class called a car. That car will have some features. And out of those features that are generic, I will create different kinds of cars. For example, a polo car, a mini car, a beetle car, a truck. These are all different kinds of cars. But the basic principle is the same. So when you do object oriented programming, you create a template and then you customize it to suit different scenarios. So if you think about it, again, each car will have some common things that it can do. A car can go forward, it can go backward, it can turn left, it can activate a horn, it can. You can press the brake. These are common things that all cars will have. Now, how they go forward or backward may change from a tractor will be different from, say, a saloon car. But essentially, they'll all basically go do the same thing when they go forward. Maybe the acceleration or the speed will be different. So that was the whole concept of object training program is create a template and then reuse it. Like they say, the golden rule of CAD is never draw the same thing twice. Create something and reuse it and customize it. So in object oriented programming, you have the concept of class, which is a template, and then you create some specific objects of those classes. Those of you who do Revit modeling would recognize that when you drag a window from a family and drop it into a wall, and you drag another window of the same type and drop it into the wall, when you change 
the parameters of one of those windows, all the other instances will change because they are all brothers, they are all siblings, they all came from the same class. You have to literally select one window and, and, and rename it so that it becomes unique. So actually, the Revit modeling that you do is based on object-oriented programming. And this will become a bit clearer as, as we go forward. So every car object, for example, is expected to follow a certain pattern of a behavior of, 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 of a method. Methods do things. All cars will have a horn. All cars can brake. They can turn right. They can reverse. They can go forward and backward. This is very important. So because they can all do this, which means all these cars have a pattern. So pattern is very, very important in object-oriented programming because it means all cars have a pattern of doing things. The way they do it may be slightly different, but the concept of the patterns is the same. They are all cars. They move forward. They move backward. They have doors. They have windows. They have tires. The tires might be different in number or in size, but essentially the pattern is the same. So that's very important because when you have a pattern, it means you can reuse components. Which means when you write your code, you can do it such a way that that code can be customized and reused many, many times. Like they say in, uh, in, in tailoring, those of you who know tailoring or fashion design, they say measure 200 times but cut once. All right, so you use something many, many times and, and, and make sure you get it right. Okay, don't repeat the same thing again and again and again. Now, if I go and give you some other analogy of, of object oriented programming, look at this uh, um, uh, slide here. It shows you that you have a dog class, it's a base class. Okay, now you're just creating, a, I want to create a dog. Now, that dog will have some properties associated with that dog. Well, that means, like, what, what are the things that make this dog uh, a dog? It will have a color, uh, eye color, it will have a height, it will have a length, a width, maybe a weight. But the dog can do certain things, like it can sit down. It can lie down, it can shake, it can come, it can wag its tail, it can, it can back. Those are methods, the things that it can do, the actions it can do. Now, when you have a specific dog called Rain or Bingo or Jack, that is an object now of uh, a dog that came from the class. You can also create uh, an Alsatian dog, you can create a poodle, you can create a, a, a terrier, a bulldog. These are all different instances of dog, but they all belong to the dog class. So if you think about it from a construction perspective, when you have a column like in Revit, for example, that is a class, okay? But what kind of column do you want? You can create an object of a column, which means you can have a round column or a rectangular column. And even when you take a rectangular column, you can have a rectangular column that is 450 by 600 or is a rectangular column that is 600 by 700 millimeters, or you can have a round column of different radiuses or, di or diameters. So these are all instances. These are all concepts that came about from the column class. Now, this might sound a little bit technical but this is very very fundamental to how the world of programming actually evolved and why when you want to go into coding you need to respect this thing because object-oriented programming is the most important concept you learn if you want to go into coding now i talked about patterns and why object-oriented object -oriented programming helps us to develop patterns we now know that in the patterns that we represent are known solutions to a current problem because if you know that a dog barks then all your dog classes should contain a back method all your uh, round columns should contain a certain amount of radius or whatever that people can change. So it means that when we do beam, for example, we, we use known examples or known solutions of patterns. For example, when you create standard columns and beams, like in, in steel columns and beams, you have like an I beam. It's a type of beam. When you create foundations, there are different types of foundations. All part foundations will generally be the same. All raft foundations will generally be the same and all pile foundations will generally be the same. They might change in thickness and depth and all that, but they're generally the same. Same thing with, with walls. Concrete walls, retaining walls, cavity walls, they're all going to be unique. All retaining walls will have the same features. So which means the person that was writing the code knows the features of a retaining wall. He knows the features of a part foundation. So anytime you want to make your own part foundation, he allows you to change the properties, like the thickness, the depth, the height, the width, okay? And the reinforcement that you use in that part foundation. So whatever you do modeling in Revit, think about it. Somebody has written a code that allows you to do those things you're doing. Now you are doing it graphically, but behind it back, uh, the, in the back, uh, the, the back end is a database and some code that allows you to repeat and reuse somebody else's um, concept of, of, of programming, okay? Now you might have different variations of the types or materials that you use in all your objects, but essentially they come from the same class, okay? So the way you actually model in Beam is based on the way programming actually works. Create classes and from them you create objects that can be different. Now, again, talking about patterns, we know again, like I've said, it's about reusable models or architectures, which can be used to solve a particular problem that occurs again and again and again. Like all uh, straight foundations basically are solving the same kind of problem again and again and again. 
However, somebody once said that each pattern that you, you, you develop describes a problem that occurs over and over again in our environment. It's not about computing now, he's just talking about an environment. And then this pattern describes the core solution to that problem in such a way that you can use that solution a million times over without ever having to do it the same way again twice. The person who said this was someone called Christopher Alexander. Those of you that read a little why may recognize the name. He's a British American architect. This is his, what he looks like. He wrote a book that's one of the most important books in construction and maybe even programming called The Timeless Way of Building and a Pattern Language. Believe it or not, this idea that he created, it was, I think it was about um, how you create cities and buildings, saying, look, once we know the way we lay out cities, we can do that in every different town, in every country. Once we know how we do walls, we can repeat that pattern again and again. This guy is an architect. It was this concept that he explained that people in the 1970s took and created what you call object-oriented programming. So believe it or not, the father of modern programming is an architect. Isn't that surprising? So for those of you who are thinking, hmm, what has architecture or construction got to do with coding? Surprise, surprise. One of us, a built environment professional, is the father of modern day object-oriented programming. Okay? So many people might think we don't have a business with programming, but yes, we do. One of us came up with the concept that people in software actually use today to call object-oriented programming. And that's why sometimes when you Google architecture, you might find out a lot of examples that you see there are not about buildings, they are about software architecture, you know? But that's a, that's a reason for it. The way we have uh, components that we call buildings, that's how software people also create certain architectures of software. Okay, I don't want to dwell too much into this because I might boil your pants off, but essentially there's similarity between how architecture of construction works and how the architecture of software works. But surprise, surprise, the architecture of software developed as a, uh, an offshoot of how an architect came up with a way of solving problems again and again and again. Because when you think about it, every software that you know solves the problem again and again and again. When you write, you know, when you do word processing in Microsoft Word, the way you did it last time is the way you do it next time. You open a Word document, you type, you format, you print, you save it. Recurring patterns, that's very, very important. So, now having said that, excuse me, um, contrary to what people might think, one of the main reasons why architects, engineers, or construction industry need to revisit programming is because we have so much in common with programming. And because of the digital transformation that's going on in industry, we need to get back to these roots. You cannot have digital transformation without digital technology. Everybody knows that. Well, surprise, surprise, digital technology relies on computing. Hey, and computing itself relies on coding. Do you see a pattern here? So we need to understand that, you know, what we call the transformation itself has coding at its heart. It doesn't mean everyone has to learn coding, but I'm happy that all you guys are listening to me today. And maybe I might inspire you to understand why you might just want to learn a little bit of coding here and there. So let's carry on. Now that we understand the history of modern coding, modern programming, and the fact that one of us, a built environment professional and architect, more or less was the father of modern coding programming uh, approaches called OOP, the next question is, you may ask me, so why would an AC pro professional learn to code now? Wh why? I, I already can use Revit, I can use AutoCAD, I can use uh, spreadsheet, I can do this. Well, let's take a closer look at this uh, uh, issue. You have to understand that there are two schools of thought today about coding. This is not about architecture and engineering now, it's about generally, why should anyone learn to code? There are two schools of thought. The first school of thought says, coding is like accounting. It's very sophisticated. That is, it's so specialized that you need a qualified accountant to help you do your taxes or to audit your company accounts at the end of every tax year. That's what they feel like, okay? It's a school of thought and it's not, there's nothing wrong with that per se, it's just one philosophy of life. In short, what they're saying is that we should leave coding to software developers because they are specialists in coding. We should just go about and do our own thing. We shouldn't ever come close to coding. Hmm. There's another school of thought that I belong to which says coding is not like accounting. It's like English that we all learn in primary and secondary school. We are not all going to be best-selling authors like Chino Achebe or you know, uh, some best-selling author like uh, John Grisham. No. We all use English in different ways. Some of us will only simply send SMS. Some of us will compose email with English. Some of us will write reports. Some will produce novels and dissertations, some really complex stuff. But we all use English in different ways. So you cannot, in my opinion, this is why I be, I, what I believe. You cannot say uh, only specialists should do coding. Everybody can use coding, but to what extent? This is where you can draw the line, okay? And this is why in the UK and the US, within the last three, four years, I believe, they've made coding more or less compulsory in most of the, in the secondary schools uh, as a subject. Now, it doesn't mean everybody's going to become a coder, but they realize how important it is in today's world. 
All right. Now, the point is not that you learn coding in secondary school and become a developer, a software developer, but in today's world, any knowledge of coding, no matter how small, no matter how small will be very useful, believe it or not. Okay. So having said that, when you look at a typical software developer, if you really know how software development works, you have to understand that the knowledge of coding itself actually is not enough to develop any software because the software simply solves a problem. If you look at a hospital software, it probably helps people to manage patients and register them and take their temperature and record all their medical history. If you look at an accounting software, it does something for accounting. Look at the banking software, it does something for banking. All software generally help us solve problems. But those that wrote that software, traditionally, they don't really know the industry. You know, what I'm trying to say is, a software developer, developer cannot sit down and simply create an app for a pharmacist or an app for a banking. He has to have a banker or a pharmacist or a medical doctor sitting next to him as part of the team telling him, oh, yes, when you click this, we want this to come up. When you do that, we want something to come up. When the person logs in, we want him to see this. And this is when you multiply this by that, you want to get this value. So software developers know how to write software, but they don't necessarily always know the industry software, the industry knowledge. That's what we call the domain knowledge. Okay? Now, it's possible that with time, when a software developer works with bankers for a long time, he ends up understanding how banking works. Then we say he has acquired domain knowledge of that subject area. But originally, he was not a banker. He was not an economist. Same way, if a software developer works with medical doctors or farmers, they will develop experience in that area. They will gather enough domain knowledge to make them comfortable. It doesn't make them farmers or bankers, but they know enough to be able to you know, uh, function semi-independently. So why is this important? Okay. Because instead of when, when you have a software developer and you have to work with a team of experts in those areas, you're kind of limited, isn't it? Because every time you want to make a change, you have to be sure that that change is not going to have some catastrophic effect on the way that software will function. Because you just know how to put the code together, but you don't really know how the process works in the real industry. Okay? And with time, when you become an expert, then yes, you can kind of get more and more confidence. But it doesn't necessarily make you a software developer that works with farmers or bankers for 15 years does not necessarily become a banker. He's still a software developer. Now, just think about it. If that software developer already has domain knowledge of that industry, for example, if that software developer is a structure engineer or an architect or a QS, just imagine the unlimited potential and the opportunities that that software developer has. There's almost nothing he cannot do. He's not limited by anything. Okay? And that's the kind of era that we're entering in this world today, where software development is no longer the, the exclusive right of people who went and study software development. Anybody that has domain knowledge can actually go and write a software or a piece of code that can solve a unique problem that a software person cannot even imagine. The kind of things that you can solve with your domain knowledge, a software developer doesn't even really know. I mean, think about it. If you are in a big construction company like, let's say, Julius Berger in Nigeria, and you hire a software guy to come and help you write your software, that software guy doesn't know a lintel. He doesn't know what the foundation is, or, or when you say the column will buckle, or when you say the span of the beam, or whatever. He doesn't know all these things. He has to work with you for a long time to be able to understand, oh, this is what this means. You understand? So domain knowledge is terribly important in software development. Not every software developer has to have domain knowledge. Some of them will always work with experts. But what I'm saying is, when you have domain knowledge and then you add software development top, wow, the opportunities and the, you know, the uh, potentials are almost unlimited. Okay? You don't need a middleman. You can simply go and do whatever you fancy doing. Right. So more or less, what is happening in today's world is that every industry, whether it's architect, the construction industry, whether it's banking industry, whether it's retail, whether it's finance, every industry now realizes that they need their own in, inbred army of coders, people from their own industry that can kind of think and write some piece of code. You know? And this coding level or expertise will be of different levels. They don't all have to be experts or 100% coders, but they need to have an idea here and there so that they can help bridge that gap between the domain world and the software world. Okay? So, because sometimes it can just, your, your coders can simply work with external software developers to enhance the product and services. Every time you want to make a change, they can help you make that transition and explain things to the coders. But you know what? There's a popular saying nowadays. I don't know how many of you have heard this, but they say, if you went to university simply to learn software development or coding, you wasted four years. Because you don't need a degree to learn coding. And everybody that is aware of the IT world knows you don't need to go to uh, a university to get a degree just to learn software development. You can learn it on your own. Now, you can go to university to learn software engineering or computer engineering. That's a different thing. But if you just write code and that's why you went to university, mm, I'll probably say, yeah, it's a waste of four years. You can learn that on your own if you're disciplined. Or you can go to a, a computer school or a diploma. You don't have to go and do a degree just to learn how to write software. That's how easy, if I may put it that way, that's how easy it is to learn software development. 
okay? Maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people were kind of scared, they were worried, but not like that anymore. So you can learn coding on your own, maybe through online tutorials, or you can go to a boot camp, and in just a matter of months, you can just become proficient enough in, in coding. And I explain all these things later, the, the, the different approaches that you can use uh, um, in the next section. Right, now going back to the AC professionals, what can you do with, with different levels of coding? What, what are the kind of things that you can achieve if you learn to code? Why would you be motivated to go into coding? But you can do things like automate some simple tasks. There's some things you do with say BIM or Revit, for example, where you're doing some tedious things. Let's say, for example, you have a project and you're doing a Revit model of a building and you have like 100 sheets. And all of a sudden you realize that you have to change the numbering system of those sheets or the labeling or the, the, the client's name or something like that. Imagine going to each sheet and, and editing that. It's going to be tedious. Or you want to, you have a complex building where all the columns on the fifth floor have to be changed into a certain size or certain material. Imagine having to do that one after the other because you may have customized them, you know. But with things like visual coding through things like Dynamo, you can not only automate things, you can even automate the design process. You can try so many parameters by just simply dragging and dropping certain kind of uh, um, wire. I'll explain this later on. Some kind of way of wiring the parameters you want to change without having to write a line of code. We call this visual coding. You don't have to actually write a script. You can do visual scripting, okay? So those things can really, really help you to make certain things and make life much, much, much easier than you can imagine. Another reason is that you might want to create your own macro plugin that will run inside Revit or Navisworks. Maybe it's using something like C Sharp or, or, or Python, which means it's a special kind of code that you've written that can do a special kind of task, okay? Some of these tasks you can do them with Dynamo, but there are some things you can do with macros and plugins that uh, maybe you might not be able to achieve with Dynamo, okay? And I'll explain later on what's a macro or a plugin. Basically, a macro is a piece of code that you just run, like your Excel macro that you can automate some calculations with, with it automatically. But a plugin is one when you go, for example, Revit, you go to add-ins and you actually click and an, an interface appears and you actually do some exceptional, uh, some, some unique tasks with that interface. So it's a kind of uh, an additional tool on top of that software. But the macro is part of that software. It's part of Revit, part of Navisworks. But a plugin is a little bit different, but it runs inside Revit or Navisworks. I'll explain all this a little bit later. Um, but sometimes you might actually want to develop a full-fledged application. Why not? You might decide that, you know what, the kind of contracts that we do as a construction company, we need our own unique software that can manage the stakeholders in a certain way. Yes, why not? You can develop a software that you can install on your desktop or a laptop. And, and this is rare. AEC professionals don't necessarily do this, but it's, if you take your coding and programming seriously, after some years, you will be in a position to actually write your own software. If, but especially if that software doesn't exist already, or if it exists, but it's too expensive, or it exists, it's not expensive, but it doesn't quite fit into your own local context. Maybe it's based on some American standards, but it doesn't quite fit the way you do things in your own country. For example, some complaints people have about Navisworks is that um, it doesn't quite follow the way people do measurement. If you want to do material takeoff in Navisworks, like in the UK, we follow the new rules of measurement. Um, in parts of Africa, in Africa, they use maybe SMM7 or whatever. And Navisworks is an American-based product, so they don't necessarily follow what your local context will be. So you might want to write your own software that can do your own measurement in your own way. It's possible. Okay, but then you can also develop enterprise level applications on the web because nowadays a lot of software is going to the browser, like your um, Office 365 is your Office software, Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, but running on the browser in your, in your Firefox or in your Google Chrome or whatever. Okay, and what we call BIM 360 is a platform that Autodex is developing right now where a lot of its applications are running in the browser. It's possible that in the future, from what we've learned, that even Revit itself might run on the browser. So you don't need to install it on your desktop. You actually just go to your browser with internet connection and then you log in and just use the software like that. BIM 360 is a perfect example of a browser-based application. So yes. Yes? This, can we have a few minutes? Uh, the platform is shutting down. I need to restart it. Oh, I see. So I have to restart this problem, problem from my hand. Excellent. So let's carry on, please. Um, sorry for that problem. Um, I was talking about how, or, or, or sorry, the different ways that um, AC professionals can do different levels of coding. I went through task automation using visual scripting in Dynamo. I talked about how you can create macros or plugins that run inside Revit or Navisworks using maybe C Sharp or Python. And I talked about how you might want to create your own unique desktop application because maybe the industry doesn't have anything that suits your needs or you have a new opportunity to, to create new solutions that no one has thought of before. And I also talked about how uh, you can also develop web-based applications, like those that uh, we call um, uh, software as a service, where you, people just log into the browser, like in 360, and just use the software 
and, and, the, and the log out. But then again, there are other ways of using coding now. It's like with blockchain development where you can create smart contracts. And, but this is a very complex topic and I don't want to dwell into it, but maybe it could be a topic for another webinar, how maybe blockchain can be useful to people in the construction industry. Um, but then again, there are other things like virtual reality and augmented reality applications that if you know a bit of coding, you can do some, some really fantastic things. And I know some people think VR is just a matter of bringing a big model into um, some head-mounted display or app and just navigate. No, I'm talking about serious applications where you actually write scripts that can do certain things. When somebody's in the virtual world, when they come to a door, it opens. When the entire lift it goes up, when they clap their hands, the lights come on. There are ways you can automate certain things and make the virtual world look almost real by automate, by writing scripts that can create some extra functionality. So VR is not just about visualization, like many architects might think. You can use it for what we call serious games. You know, they're like your PlayStation games, but they have some interactivity that makes them. They're not entertainment games. They're just for people to. Um, to solve some particular problems, maybe for training and, and the rest of that, okay? So these are some of the six um, typical areas that a, a person might be thinking of going into. Um, maybe, for example, in order of complexity, I'll put a blockchain last, and then VR might come somewhere up there. It's not really that difficult. And um, yeah, so I want to quickly explain some of these things I've talked about. Like we, we, The first one was visual uh, programming, you know? And uh, for those of you who are interested and are attending the uh, Lagos BIM workshop, we have a session, I think, on day five, where my colleague Chris will give a gentle introduction uh, to Dynamo BIM. But here you can see someone is actually scripting, but he's not writing code, like programming language, whatever, you know? He's just using all these blocks and creating connections between columns and beams. And if you want to change the diameter or the length of an object, you can simply do that by clicking an arrow and typing a value or something like that. So it's a way of coding, but it's called visual scripting. And it's, it's, it's easy for most people to be able to handle this sort of thing, all right? Um, in terms of macros and plugins, when you want to write a macro, it's like you have to write your own script that runs inside, say, something like Revit. You have to know a bit of a programming language to be able to do that. And this is an example of the kind of lines, sorry, lines of code you might write. Maybe you want to create some new kind of unique walls that Revit does not allow you to create those kind of walls. It doesn't exist, but you can create your own script that will create certain walls of certain properties, and you can run it inside your Revit mod, uh, software, or even share it with other people so that you can also um, uh, use it. But once you find that your macro is something that other people will use a lot, then you're better off uh, maybe creating a plugin, and I'll talk about that. So when you have your macros, you can have a list of all your macros. For example, you can have macros that help you delete objects. You can have macros that help you um, um, create sheets and change them. You can have macros that help you automate certain tasks. It all depends on what you want, okay? Um, and you can have them all listed, and you can write them in VB.net, you can write them in C Sharp, uh, and maybe in Python as well, all right? Again, on day five of the BIM workshop, I will talk about um, an introduction to developing macros for Revit using something like C Sharp. You're not gonna finish that session knowing how to do C Sharp or macros, but you will demystify the whole thing for you so that you might pick up interest and decide your journey might include, uh, your journey in this just information might include a little bit of uh, macro development, okay? Um, so the other things, of course, plugins, they're different from macros. But when you see that your macro is being used by many people externally or you want to make money out of it, you are probably better off creating into a plugin, which means people actually install your macro as an add-in or a plugin for something like Revit. And some of you who go to the add-in sections of Revit a lot, you will see some plugins that have been developed, okay? Maybe they started their life as a macro, but now they become so useful and so complex that they become a plugin or an add-in like they say in America, okay? And um, this is another plugin, for example, that does some lighting work. There are plugins that do structural analysis. There are some special plugins that do acoustic calculation. There are some special plugins that do cost estimating. There's some special plugins that just uh, even do uh, construction management activities or something like that, okay? And in fact, a lot of the plugins that you see in the Autodesk Exchange, if you go to Autodesk Exchange, it's an app store, you see some plugins that many people have developed that you can use with your Revit or Navisworks. Sometimes these things are so helpful and so important that Autodesk themselves make it part of Revit. They take that idea and they convert it into Revit. Now, whether they pay for that license or how they do it, I don't know. But just, it just tells you that any app or any plugin that you develop a macro can end up becoming such a big thing because it's just so useful that other people will use it and become so popular that even Revit will adopt that idea, okay? So the, the world of opportunity is quite uh, unlimited if you know how to do uh, macros and plugins, all right? So like I explained in day five, we'll go into this um, in, in form of an introductory session how do you go about developing macros or plugins in Revit using C Sharp? Um, but I talked about also um, full-fledged desktop applications. Maybe, for example, you work for a QS company or a contracting company, and you, there's a way you do your procurement or contracting 
or your, your processes that, you know, there's just no solution out there that can solve your problem. Or the, like I said, the solutions are expensive. You, you can't afford it. The licenses is killing you. Or maybe it does not take into cognizance some of the local context that you want to um, put into the, um, your processes. So you might end up developing your own desktop application. And this is an example of a software called Cost X. You know, it's run by, and I, and I think, an Australian company. But there's no reason why another company, whether it's a software company or a consulting or contracting company, cannot develop its own software. And many people do this. You know, many hospitals in, in Nigeria or other parts of Africa have their own unique software that helps them run their clients and whatever. Hotels have their own in-house software. You know, engineering companies sometimes also have their own in-house software. So yeah, if you know how to code, you might be very, very invaluable to your company, how you then end up developing an in-house tool that will help them uh, um, automate their processes. Okay. And then, of course, I've talked about the web-based um, applications. These applications that you write with code, but those codes will run, uh, those software will run on the browser. On the left-hand side, you see uh, BIM 360, which is a, a very important. BIM 360 docs a very popular um, document management system. On the right-hand side, you have a similar product called Four Projects. It's, uh, it used to be an, a UK software, but I think it's owned by Viewpoint now, which is an American company. So there's quite a lot that you can do now if you want to go into web development. It's a special branch of software development called web development. You develop software, but it's meant for the web. Like your banking applications, your banking apps are all web development. But your, 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 your phone will probably use an Android or an iOS app, which is not really a web development thing. It's a, it's a mobile development. So there's desktop apps, there are mobile apps, and there are web apps. There are, these are three different kinds of apps that you can use. Actually, there are more than that. There are also um, TV apps, like your smart TVs. There are some apps you can develop just to run on, on, on smart TVs, believe it or not. In, in smart TVs, you can download apps like games and stuff like that that you can play on your TV as, uh, in your house. So there are many platforms that are emerging now. Okay, But just like your ATM machine has a software, those are ATM apps. There are also apps. You know what I mean? Your device that you use maybe for measuring or whatever in, in, in a hospital that's automated also. Those are unique apps that work on unique different uh, kind of platforms. But for most people, the type of apps you create will be desktop, mobile, or web. Okay, so let's move on. In terms of blockchain development, this is uh, uh, popularly uh, used for smart contracts and other things like that. And I don't want to dwell too much on this because this is a really, really complex topic and I'll probably just discourage many people if I start to talk about how it all works. But you can create smart contracts if you know a little bit of uh, JavaScript or um, some other similar language like that or Java. And, and, and this is really not something I want to dwell into. Okay, but only those who are so good at coding, they're so comfortable at writing software will bother to go into blockchain development. It's not something that anybody can just start immediately. You have to start small and then go into the world. And then, of course, with VR development, you can write your own scripts that can help you automate certain things in the VR simulation or, um, or app or something like that. Again, in doing the workshop, we have, um, uh, I think on day five, there will be an overview of how you can use VR with your beam processes and how you might write some scripts that can help you automate certain things so that people have an interesting and a rich VR environment that is not just visualizations. Things happen when you step on this part of the room, the lights will come on. When you point your uh, control on the left-hand side, the door will open, you know? When you clap your hand, the staircase will, you know, whatever. Things, all kinds of things can happen. It's about automation. Right, in summary, what I'm trying to say is that coding or programming is at the heart of BIM and digital construction. Some people want to live in denial. They'll tell you, oh, BIM and all these things. BIM is just a process. Yes, yes, it's just a process, but we cannot do BIM without software. And we cannot do digital construction without BIM of some sort. And what, what do BIM and digital construction have in common? Computing, okay, like I've explained earlier. So at the heart of it is coding. Like I've said, it's not everybody that should learn coding. It's not necessary. But recognizing this means it's an extra opportunity for that person who has the resilience or the determination to approach this um, uh, line of uh, thinking. Because for somebody, it might be a QS that graduated from university, is looking for a job, He's not getting a job or he's bored with his job. He's looking for something new. You might say, you know what? Let me learn a bit of coding and maybe I can become a specialist QS who can code. That will open new worlds of opportunities for you. Why not? So in other words, like I, like I said, um, coding and programming are important to digital transformation or, or, and digital construction in BIM. And because there's a lot of computer programmers out there, but they don't know anything about QS. They don't know anything about architecture. They don't know anything about structural engineering. You have to sit down with one of these professionals before they can even think of developing an app for that professional to use. So that shows you the importance of domain knowledge. Okay? Even a nurse, a nurse has a lot of important domain knowledge about nursing that if she could learn how to code, 
she can write some kind of apps that even a, 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 an experienced software developer would not even think about creating that kind of app because she knows the problem she faces every day and that software will help her solve that problem in a unique way. So the point is that uh, as an AC professional, you don't have to wait for Autodex or Bentley or Tecla to tell you what you can do with BIM or digital construction. No, they will only develop the software that is marketable for them while they can make their profit, okay? So you can take initiative and come up with your own ideas and come up with your own semi tools that can complement what they're doing. In fact, it's not in their co in commercial interest to design or give you software that can do all the things possible. It doesn't make sense because the way one architect will use a BIM application is different from you and different architect will use. One structural engineer needs to use Revit structure a different way from another structural engineer. One specializes in steel and another person specializes in concrete. So what these companies like Autodesk and Bentley do is that they give you just enough what is the common thing that most of these professionals will use? Then they create their software that will solve most of these problems. If you want something extra, they now allow you to use their APIs to create your own plugins or your own macros. You see the connection there? That's why Autodesk, for example, has something called Autodesk Exchange, where people that have developed their own apps or plugins can go there and sell it. It's an app that has been developed for a plugin that has been developed to run with Revit 2019. You can download it for $5 or maybe it's free and it can help you do certain tasks. Because Autodex know that they need people to create this ecosystem of, 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 of supporting applications. It doesn't make economic sense for them to solve everybody's problem. It's not possible. So the people that come up with specializations can create those supporting applications that will help Autodex achieve its objective in the long run. So it's in Autodex's interest to support people like yourselves if you're interested in going into coding so that you can develop something that will enhance their own basic software. And I want to uh, emphasize this thing. This is Henry Ford. Those of you that know Henry Ford, he was a guy who... Uh, invented maybe the Ford uh, line of automobiles, and he was one of the fathers of modern automobiles. He said something a long time ago. He said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. I want that to sink in. You know why he said this? He said this because at that time when he was inventing the Ford car, people were riding horses, okay? If he, as an entrepreneur, had come to ask people in society, in American society, how do you want me to improve your transportation? You say, oh, can you give us a horse that can run 300 kilometers a day without getting tired, without eating food or resting or whatever, because all their life was all about horses. So the, the, the point here is that sometimes you don't have to ask people what they want because they just think in their own world in the present today. Sometimes you have to think outside the box and create a solution that people have not even thought about. And that is what coding can help you do. There are some problems faced by construction managers or builders or urban planners or estate managers or QSCs or architects. There are some problems being faced by some of them in Africa or in Asia that is unique to them, that when you can write or code, you can solve that unique problem for them. Maybe because of the policies or the standards or the way permission is given for buildings to be constructed or the way procurement works. I don't know. It could be the way design works. It could be some demand from society for certain kinds of buildings or whatever. But the software that you use every day will not solve that problem for you. So you have to go out of your way, if you can, to create a solution for that. And it will not just help you, it can help other people and you can actually make a lot of money from it. So think about it this way. If Ford had asked people what they wanted a long time ago, early in the 20th century or late 19th century, they would have said faster horses. Okay, right. So in other words, if you learn how to code, the world of BIM and digital construction, in my opinion, will be at your feet. Now, it doesn't mean other people who don't code will not take advantage of BIM and digital construction, but you will be like a superhero because most of those people who just use Revit, Navisworks, Tecla, uh, Archicad, they are, yeah, they're consumers of software. They use other people's product. But you, if you can code, you are a creator of software or a plugin or a macro, whatever. So you are operating at a slightly different, not slightly, actually, you are operating at a much higher level, a much more sophisticated level. Again, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to advocate that every architect or engineer or QS or whatever goes into coding. No. I'm just saying in today's world, it's so important that some of us really need to go into it. Otherwise, we'll be at the mercy of software people and they will not give us the things that we need for our own industry. Okay? Um, but one thing that you can also benefit by learning how to code is that it's not always about even creating new software. Sometimes it's about take, taking other people's macro or plugins and customizing it to suit your needs. Sometimes there are a lot of macros and free codes that are out there for macros like Revit macros that you can take. It's not quite what you want, but it's, you have a good starting point. All you need to do is just edit a few things. Maybe the macro was developed to change columns into something, but you can use it to change walls into something or windows. And you see, that's a, a, a fast way of, you know, cost, uh, of creating a new solution because you are more or less um, uh, reusing somebody else's code, okay? Because he has created a pattern that you can reuse, okay? And 
besides, at the end of the day, if you can code, it means you are one of those rare species of human beings that can talk to computers the way your colleagues cannot. Okay, your colleagues can interact with computers, but they cannot talk to computers because the only way you can talk to a computer and give it order and command is to write a code. Computers only understand code. Okay, now you might think that, oh, my app or my, 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 my mobile app or my laptop, I can talk to it and it convert my speech into text. We call them speech to text applications, you know, like Google, um, what do you call it, like Siri and Google, whatever, Google Talk. Yeah, that is a software, it's not magic. Somebody wrote a software that each time you speak and say a word, it takes those words and converts them into words. And then those words are now typed out as text. So you can actually dictate what you're saying and it's, it's an application will be writing it out in form of a text. So those would have made that possible as superhuman beings, you know. In fact, people say the real superheroes of today are coders. All the other superheroes, you know, are fake. All the Superman, Batman, they are fake. But we really have real superheroes. Yes, there are people who can code because they can do extraordinary things. I think they say next to God, <laughs> The next most powerful people in the world today are computer programmers because they can do an awful lot of things that ordinary people cannot do. So again, remember, we do not all have to learn to code. It's not required that everyone learns to code, but for those who have the time or the interest, it can be very helpful. This way, it's not everybody that must learn how to drive a car. Goodness sake, I don't think Dangote, the richest black man, is a very good driver. Maybe he can drive, maybe he doesn't, because why does he need to learn to drive a car? It's not important for him to drive a car. All he needs to do is get from point A to point B to make millions of dollars. See my point? An Uber driver, on the other hand, is going to drive cars every day. So it's important for him not just to learn how to drive a car, but to become an expert driver. So people will need driving to different extents. Okay? But also a Formula One driver will need to know driving much more than an Uber driver because he is going to drive at a very fast pace with a Formula One car. His life might be at risk and it's important that he gets things right. So there are levels. That's all I'm saying. There are levels of doing anything. And coding is also something that has levels. So if you just want to master other people's end products, that's other people's software, like Revit, you want to master Revit, you want to master Navisworks, that's fine. That's okay. You can use their plugins on the apps, that's fine. But if you are interested or you have a need or you are just curious or you want to enhance your career or your prospects in future, yes, by all means, you can go into coding of some sort, okay? Right, again, must everyone learn to code? Absolutely no. The last thing I want to hear is some people quoting me and say, oh, Dr. Z said people should learn coding. Everybody should learn coding. Yes, I'm saying it, but I'm not saying you must learn it. Not everyone should learn coding. Some people cannot even cope with it because it requires a, a different way of thinking. It's not difficult. It's just a different way of thinking. Just like not everybody can learn French and become proficient in French. Not everybody can learn Japanese or even martial arts and become proficient in it. Some people will learn how to, um, you know, give a kick. That's the only thing I can do martial arts myself. I can give a kick, maybe whatever. It's not even a very good kick. You know, I'll, if I kick something in martial arts, I'll probably be the one that'll fall down, you know? But some people are so good at it that they just blow their, uh, with their breath, they can blow you down and you fall down even before they touch you. You see what I mean? It's about li different levels of, of, of expertise. Okay. Um, so, not everyone has to learn how to code. Um, the final part of my presentation is how, if you're interested in coding, how do you go about it? Where do you start from? What's the starting point? Okay, the first thing I'll talk about is which language will I learn? You, you hear a lot about this. Those who go into coding, not just for construction, those who go into coding in general, anybody that wants to go into coding, whether it's web apps, mobile apps, desktop apps, the first challenge you'll face is which language? And here you'll find many people swaying you. You go to Google, you type, which language will I learn first? Which programming language is the most important one? Which programming language is most popular? You hear all kinds of things. You go to places like Corab.com, you go to some um, forums, and I will tell you this, anyone that tells you that one particular programming language is the best, believe me, that person is ignorant. And you can quote me anywhere. Anybody, whether he's a software developer or not, whether he's a professor of coding, if he tells you that a particular language is the best, he's ignorant or he's misleading you. Why do I say this? Because it's like asking somebody which vehicle is the best. What do you mean by which vehicle is the best? It depends. For a farmer, a tractor is the best vehicle. Wouldn't you agree? For an Uber driver, hey, a car that's well efficient, maybe it's Japanese, is the best because he drives every day. For an executive, a banker, for example, an expensive German saloon where he can impress his clients, is the best choice. That's the best vehicle for him. For a poor man, hey, the best vehicle for him is his two legs. So for, to, for someone to say one language is the best is just being ignorant. It all depends on your situation. Okay? So this is the first thing you have to understand. If you want to go into the world of coding, don't fall into that trap of, oh, people said JavaScript is the best. 
They said Python is the best. They said Sheetstab is the best. There's no such thing. It depends on your situation, what you want to use it for, or what the market demands. Okay? So the language that you choose depends on the type of need you have or the type of application you want to create. You might want to create a desktop or mobile application. Some languages are better suited for that. You might want to create a plugin or a standalone application. Hey, some languages are better for that. Is it an in-house application or is it something that would be used commercially? Again, there are some languages that lend themselves to do all this sort of uh, specialization. So don't get into that trap to think that you have learned the best language. No, you learned one language or you, you pick one language because you, it's going to help you in one particular way. Now, some of those languages are, are, are so versatile that you can use them for desktop, for web, for in-house applications, for commercial applications, for plugins, for macros. Some of them are flexible, but there's some that specialize in certain things and you need to choose carefully, okay? But if you were to choose, I would say choose a language that helps you understand OOP. That's object oriented programming. Any language that you feel will help you understand OOP easily, take that language. Okay? And maybe during the question and answer session, I'm gonna make some suggestions to where which language might, might be a good way to go about it. Okay. Now, after you settle on a language, how do you go about learning that language? Do you go the self-taught approach? Do you go through online tutorials or do you go to a classroom or a bootcamp? Well, the self-taught route is, is a hard route to follow. I follow that route and I can tell you. It's not easy, but it's quite a sweet journey at the end of the day. You know, it's like teaching yourself how to get a black belt. It's the most difficult way to get a black belt. You probably have to go to a dojo of some sort to get a black belt. But if you could teach yourself how to get a black belt, just imagine. You could actually be a very good black belt teacher because you know the difficult way of like, getting a black belt. So this route is not for somebody who's not disciplined. You have to be very disciplined. You need self-motivation. You need dedication and you need consistency. Consistency is very, very key. You have to be consistent, religiously consistent, such that you have a timetable way of doing things. You don't just decide, oh, today I feel like coding, let me write some code. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to have a kind of religious consistency, a dedication. If you want your coding time is 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. every day, you must wake up and write code. It's, I say to those who ask me, how, how often should you write code? I say, look, spending one hour coding every day for five days, that's five hours, right? is more valuable than spending 10 hours on a Saturday. So that's the disadvantage of the uh, boot camps, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an, it can be an efficient way if you have that time, you know, and you, you can dedicate two or three months and you have the money, by all means go to a boot camp or a training um, school and learn. But remember while you are learning, don't just learn it for the sake of learning, all right? You can't just go and learn uh, a particular language just because a, 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 a boot camp is offering that language. You have to know why am I learning this language, you know, and um, how is it going to help me? What am I going to learn? What am I going to use for me? Because those people that will teach you those languages in those boot camps, they're not construction people. They're not AEC professionals. All they're doing is just teaching you a Python or a C Sharp or Java. How you use it is up to you. Okay? So you have to be aware of that. Now, another thing you have to consider when you think about how you want to learn coding is something called the Pareto Principle. Now, this is where I, as a person, uh, have learned the hard way about a style of learning, okay, of coding. The Pareto Principle is basically saying that for everything you want to do, that's the 80 20 principle. For example, think about it. If you want to learn French language, does it make sense for you to learn all the words in French in a dictionary, for example? It doesn't make sense. All you need to do is just master some key words in French and some sentences that you can use every day until you become better. Those words might start with greetings, basic greetings. You can learn how to greet people in French and then you learn how to make some simple conversation. Come on, ça va, ça va, bien, merci, all those sort of things. And some things like, um, how do you do business transactions with a driver, with a tomato, to sell on your market? Those little things that you use every day are the most important things you should focus on. Not trying to learn all the French words because you get overwhelmed and you never even use all the French words. So basically, in programming, you do not try to learn all the concepts. That's a mistake some people make. And that's the danger of going to online tutorials or the danger of going to boot camps. They might just teach you all the concepts in Python, all the important concepts in C Sharp. But you don't, do you really need all these concepts? That's the question. You should be able to focus on those few concepts that you use most of the time. 
This is where the 80-20 principle, or what we call the Pareto principle, comes in. It says that for many events in life, 80% of the outcomes or the effects come from 20% of the causes. Let me explain that in a layman's term. It means that if you are developing an app in any language, what are the 20% concepts of that programming language that you will use 80% of the time, rather than learn all the different things that you can learn about that programming language? Or if it's French, for example, what are those 20% French words that I will use 80% of the time? That principle applies to most things in life. If you look at a language like Italian or German, you'll find out that there 20% of words and phrases that if you can master them, most of the time, these are the things you use 80% of the time. Now, it doesn't mean these are the only things you learn, but it means if you master this, later on you can add a little bit more when the need arises. But don't go and master something when you never use it or you rarely use it. It doesn't make sense. So for those of you who might go the self-taught route, you have to find out what is the 80-20 principle you want to apply for whatever language you're going to use. For those of you that go to online tutorials, watch out. Or boot camps, watch out. What are what, these things they're teaching me? This concept, do I really need to master it that much? You know, you might talk to people who know the language, experts who are familiar with that language, and I might tell you, yeah, actually, no, you only use this concept when you are creating an application that many people log in at the same time and use. Or you only use this application when you want to create something that can connect to a server. In that case, if you're not going to do something that work with server, what's the point in learning that concept? It doesn't make sense. Okay? Another thing you have to do in terms of how you learn how to code is to use something called project based learning. Don't just learn software development and just go and put it on your CD. Hey, I've learned software development and there it is. I can do software. No. Create a portfolio of one or two projects, maybe three. Create something, no matter how simple. Create a simple application that can maybe do quantity takeoff or that can estimate the scheduling of a construction project. Maybe it doesn't use a Gantt chart, but at least it can estimate based on this uh, critical path. It can do something. So some, something very simple, you know? A simple macro that can just automate certain ways of creating windows of different shapes on, a, on an elevation will go a long way to demonstrate that you, you, you actually know a few things, okay? So um, that portfolio is important. Project-based learning, it's very, very, very important. Don't just learn software and start putting it in your CD, okay? Don't learn software development. Learn to create projects. And because when you learn those, um, when you do those projects, you are more or less, it's almost as if you're creating a real-world project even though it's not real world, nobody asks you to create those projects, but you're kind of applying your knowledge in a real, semi-real world environment. And this is very helpful. So rather than just learn theoretical stuff, you actually apply it and create your own application. You can create your own brief of what you want the application to do and you try to stick to it. And later on, you actually find out that, ah, this feature I wanted to create for my application. Hmm, I don't really know this concept in this language. Then you go back and learn. Maybe it's part of those 80% um, uh, of things you never really needed to learn and you go and learn that one and come back and apply it. And that's how you build your learning from stage to stage. And your future clients will be happy to see that, oh, wow, look at the work you've done. And you can impress your future clients with it. Maybe that's not what they want, but at least they can see an example of what you can do. Maybe it's your boss that you can impress. Oh, this guy is so clever. He can do software development. Hmm, let's promote him. Or maybe it's your girlfriend you want to impress. Maybe she has been saying no to you. And when you show her that you can code, she can now say yes. And you can finally go and get married and live happily ever after for whatever reason. Okay? There are ways that your project that you create when you learn to code can help you going forward. Okay? Right. Another concept I want to to you guys in terms of how you learn coding, there's something called the DIP. Okay? This is very, very, very important. Now, let me start by explaining what the DIP is. Okay? Basically, when you start to learn anything, anything at all, it is easier to learn. It's very easy. For example, if you want to learn how to drive a car, it's easy. You just enter and you sit down in a chair in the car. That's easy. The next thing you learn is how to put on your seatbelt. That's easy. Then you learn to turn the ignition. That's easy. You change gear. That's easy. You press the accelerator. That's easy. Every new concept is fun and it's interesting. Okay, maybe when you start to do parallel parking or something like that, it becomes a bit difficult or to reverse. But basically, as you are learning each concept, it is easy. That's how every learning works. Whether it's maths, it's science, it's English, it's geography. As you are learning at the beginning, fun and easy. However, when you are learning how to drive a car, for example, and now they say, the drivers, the, the driving instructor says, okay, you've learned all this thing. Let's go on a highway, an express road. And you're going to be changing gear. And I want you to overtake that lorry. I want you to turn on the wiper when it starts to rain. I want you to pause on a hill. And don't let the engine die. And then when it's time for you to move, you release the clutch and start climbing that hill. This becomes really, really overwhelming. Because all of a sudden, this little, little concept that you learn, you now have to apply them in the real world environment at the same time. That is when people get seriously overwhelmed. It becomes confusing because you'll be learning little things, but when you have to apply all of them at the same time, it overwhelms many people. At this point, we say you enter the deep. 
the deep of learning where it becomes too much to a point that you have to apply so many concepts at the same time and you don't even know where to start from. It happens with learning everything, okay? So when you start to learn to code, you also enter the deep. You have to recognize this deep and take time to reflect on what you are doing, which means at some point you learn some concepts, you're wondering, ah, this is too much now. How am I even going to use this thing? Sometimes when you enter the deep, what you need to do is to stop and say, I don't really understand this thing. I'm not sure how it's going to help me. Maybe you've been learning two tutorials, online tutorials. At that point, you might want to go and look for a book that will explain that concept for you. At that point, maybe you go and look for a forum where people can explain why that concept is important. But make sure you understand that concept and get out of that deep. Because if you don't get out of that deep, you'll be stuck there. In fact, some people that don't get out of the deep, they end up hating whatever it is they're learning. Imagine someone driving a car and he never learns how to manage the clutch in uh, a manual car. He will hate driving because he never mastered it. Because without clutch, you can't do manual driving. Automatic car is a different thing. But if you cannot manage your clutch, you will hate driving. Okay? So you have to now sit down and say, why is it that I don't know how to manage changing clutch and changing gear? Then you need to go and just practice and practice until you master it. Don't make the mistake of saying, clutch, it doesn't matter. I'll learn it one day. No. You'll find yourself on a hill one day and there are cars directly behind you and you, are, you have to now drive that hill after you stopped. And if you don't know how to manage your clutch, you are going to crash people's car behind you. And that's when you realize, I should have mastered that thing because you fell into the deep and you ignored it. Okay? In fact, sometimes the deep just makes people even abandon that thing completely. They never want to learn how to drive a car. There are many people that learn software development and then when they get into the deep, they hate software development. But that's because they didn't understand that this is normal. It's natural for you to fall into the deep. You just need to realize you're in the deep and try to get yourself out. It's like a deep is like a ditch. You have to climb out of that ditch. And, and the next slide will explain this thing. So this is how the deep works. Okay? The effort is on the x-axis and the return on your effort is on the y-axis. So when you start initially, you can see that, oh, it's in fun, it's interesting, you know? And when you want to quit, that's an early stage where you want to quit, you know what, this is not for me, quit, I'll just walk away. But when you start learning more and more, you probably enter the deep. And then, when you now quit, it's a bad way to quit because when you're in the deep and you quit, you will hate software development forever. If you quit driving because you, you, you were on a hill and you, you, you didn't know how to change the manual clutch, whatever, and you crash somebody's car behind you, maybe it's an expensive Mercedes, you will hate driving naturally because it made you, you know, do something terrible. Same way with software development. If you quit at the wrong time, you will hate it. In fact, for some people, they say, you're not even in the deep. At that point, you're on a cliff edge. You've actually fallen over a cliff and you will crash and, 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 and you, you die, literally. No, 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 not literally, but figuratively, you die and in terms of software, you will hate it. But if you stay and you're persistent and you climb out of that deep, oh my God, the benefits are outstanding. In short, let me put it this way. When you start to learn coding, maybe to write a macro in C Sharp to automate a certain task or even Dynamo, you find out that actually it is, more, it is faster for you to do it in a manual way. The visual scripting or the programming is not fast enough. But that's because you're still learning. A time will come when you master that scripting. That the way to, it's faster for you to automate it than to do it manually. That's when you know that, yes, you, 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 you started arriving. Okay? That's when you see the return in investment. Well, another way to look at it is like this. When you're learning anything, at first, you're just learning. It's easy. You don't even know you're incompetent. You're turning the ignition of the car. Mm. You, don't, you don't know that maybe five minutes ago, you didn't know how to turn the ignition of the car. So we call that unconscious incompetence. You're not even aware that you're incompetent because you just sat down in a chair and put on a seatbelt. Okay? But when you get into the deep, that is when you know, ha, huh, I'm incompetent. I don't know how to change gear. I don't know how to use a clutch. Okay? That is the part that hurts a lot because it's difficult. You are aware of your limitations. But that's when you need to preserve it. Because when you preserve it, you climb into that stage where you are conscious of your incompetence and you are willing to do something about it. You are climbing out of it. Then you become so good at what you are doing, whether you're learning a car, software development, that you now enter the world of unconscious competence, which means you can drive on a highway, change gear, turn on the wiper, put on your CD or DVD, or even watch a, 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 your, your, answer your email on your phone with one hand driving while looking backwards. That way you're such, a, such an expert, you don't even think twice about doing all these things. So if you start from the point of being incompetent unconsciously, you don't even know you're incompetent, to the point where you're so competent that you're not even aware of your competence. That's, you know, you're now an expert. Okay? The same way your barber will cut your hair without thinking twice. But a new apprentice of a barber will be thinking every time he cuts something, he is conscious not to make a mistake. Every time a new bricklayer is trying to you know, use a trowel to mix the cement, he's conscious. He doesn't want the cement to fall down. He doesn't want to break to do whatever. But if an expert bricklayer is unconsciously competent. He just moves on. So that is the journey you have to take when you want to go into anything you're learning, but especially coding. When you get into that deep 
realize that everybody has gone through that process and you are going to get out of that deep if you if you take the right measures okay so let's move on after that another thing i want to point out is lifelong learning this is important not just in software development in anything that you do nowadays because you have to keep learning after 15 years <laughs> of experience a donkey is still a donkey not a horse because nowadays you have people oh i've been writing software for 15 years so what experience can sometimes be overrated oh i've been an architect for 15 years i've been a site architect for 15 years i've been a qs for 15 years i'm sorry experience can sometimes be overrated you can be a rubbish qs for 15 years you can be a rubbish uh, uh, um, estate manager or a rubbish architect just because you spend 15 years doing shit doesn't make it good if you excuse my french okay continuous development is important so that you keep getting better and you keep becoming even more efficient in what you do so lifelong learning is very important don't learn one coding language and stand still you have to keep improving that language maybe even add more languages as you go on because when you learn python for example later on i want to add c sharp or java and believe it believe it or not it's, it's actually very easy to switch from one language it's like when you learn how to drive toyota and tomorrow somebody brings a bus maybe a toyota saloon car somebody brings a bus hey maybe the gear system might be slightly rearranged but you know how to reverse you know how to drive a bus you know how to traffic it and when you meet a tractor one day it's not going to be too different for you to make that transition from driving a saloon car to driving a bus to driving a tractor the principles are the same you understand so that's the thing you have to keep learning once you master one language you can switch to another language believe me in a matter of two to three weeks it's that easy but you have to master language you cannot be incompetent in driving a saloon car and then one day you want to go and drive a truck it doesn't make sense you will kill people okay so but when you master how to drive a saloon car it's very easy for you to master you know what i want to upgrade i want to drive a bus i want to drive a truck you can really manage that because you've mastered car driving not just how to drive a car but the principles of driving are ingrained in your system and because technology is moving faster you have to keep up and keep it up between the difference between you and your and the coding are being successful is just down to how often maybe you update it if you're not in tune with the latest software development click techniques or principles your app will be outdated and you might not even function well with the next version of Revit. so you have to keep moving up you have to keep learning just as you have to keep learning what's the new latest technology in, in beam what has changed in navisworks 2020 what has changed in Revit 2019 you have to keep learning it might be just one little tool that you might underestimate okay all right so um another thing is that the language that you're learning today they are constantly changing as well you know what i mean so you need to keep up the, the new frameworks are coming up and um uh, you have to also keep up with these frameworks that are making the language more efficient and if even if the language don't change the principle the way people apply this language will keep changing because best practices emerge all the time and you have to be up to date because sometimes you are, you are doing software development or whatever you are working in a team of, of, of other software people and you don't want to be seen to be that outdated guy who's still using that old framework that nobody's using since maybe 2009 you want to be up to date okay we live in a collaborative world so finally well not really finally the question that i'm sure every one of you will be thinking that i should answer or that they want to answer today is is coding or programming really hard how hard is it can i really learn to code uh, how about what's on the level scale of one to ten with one being very very easy and ten being wow rocket science difficult level how hard is it for me to learn how to code well it's very difficult to answer this question in a way but also it's very easy to answer that question somebody once said if it wasn't hard everyone will do it it's the heart that makes it great i don't know how many of you have heard this quotation before by someone very famous person that i respect a lot his name is tom hanks he was not talking about coding i think they were interviewing him about acting and how the, what does it take to become a very good actor and he was telling them the kind of effort you have to put in he said if acting wasn't hard everybody would do it that's the truth if singing wasn't hard all of us will have you know hits number one hits on the uh, rmd chart isn't it so if anything isn't hard, everybody will do it. It's the hard that makes it great. Think about it. Anything that is valuable is scarce. Anything that is valuable is what? Scarce. For example, I don't think you would call Uber driving a valuable career because anybody can become an Uber driver. Just learn how to drive a car, buy a car, and you're in business. I don't think selling uh, burgers and McDonald's or Chicken Republic is a valuable career because anybody can do that. But you, to become a QS, hmm, it's, it's, it's hard. That's why it's a great career you know anything that is valuable tends to be scarce and so with in terms of software development because of the kind of challenge or the hardness if you like involved with it that's why it is great that's why it's worthwhile so when you have that scenario where you're in the deep and you think is this worth it remember 
that if it was not uh, hard, everybody will be doing it. That hardness is what will make it worthwhile one day. Okay? Why are brain surgeons some of the best people in the world? Because not everybody can become a brain surgeon. Why are astronauts valued and worshipped more or less? Because it's not easy to become an astronaut. You know? Think about it. All right? Even people that catch snake, snake charmers, why are they respected and, and paid well? Because it's not easy to go approach a python or a cobra. So anything that is hard is valuable. That's just a principle I want all of you to apply, not just in coding, even in your career. You just want to be a traditional architect. You don't want to code. Become, find something that makes you unique. How hard is your career? Think about it. How hard is your job? If your employer can replace you tomorrow, believe me, you're not valuable. You have to keep asking yourself, how scarce am I as an individual? How scarce are my skills in this company? If your answer to that question is that it's not that scarce, tomorrow they can employ a fresh graduate and you can take over my job, then believe me, you better start thinking of you know, doing something to make yourself valuable. Because when it's time to lay off people, you'll be one of the first that will be laid off. Okay? You want to be an untouchable of some sort. So think about it when you learn to start learning software, that, software development, that this is one of the things that will make it worthwhile at the end of the day. And of course, for those of you that have attended my previous webinar about uh, technology adoption, I talked about how uh, you can be a laggard and then try to wait till the whole world has moved on. You can, or you can be an innovator and lead the way. So yes, when you learn software development or coding, you can be an innovator of some sort because you can do things that ordinary people don't even imagine is possible, you know? Or at least you can be an early adopter by testing and piloting other people's software and apps and the rest of that. Most people in the industry will be part of the early majority. They're just doing what everybody else is doing. But if you really want to break, you know, into the fold of um, innovators, things like coding can help you. Again, remember, I'm not saying everybody should learn, leave this webinar and go and start learning how to code. It may not be for you. Okay, you may not have the time, you may not have the patience, you may not have the aptitude for it. Yes, you have to have an aptitude for coding. Just like you have to have an aptitude for uh, accounting. Not everybody can handle accounting. Not everybody can become an architect. If you don't like drawing and, and, and modeling and, and sketching, don't go near architecture because that's all they do all the time, isn't it? You know, you don't like blood. You have business becoming a medical doctor. If you're squeamish, you don't like to sight of blood. It doesn't make sense. So please bear that in mind, okay? Right. Um, uh, the next thing I will say is that... Um, um, you have to find where you belong in this pyramid of innovation diffusion and, and, and decide where you want to move. If you think you are a laggard, try to move up faster and become an early majority or an early majority try to become an early adopter or an innovator. And you should basically, in my own opinion, you should be at the top there. Okay? If you're at the top, you should try to be an innovator or an early adopter if you really want to stand out. If you just want to be an average Joe, fine, you can be a laggard. That's not a problem. But that's how you've shaped your own life and your own career. Now, one of the things I want to say at the, at the end of this presentation is um, to quickly go through what some famous people, people who are, who are more illustrious than myself, some really famous people around the world have said a few things about coding. And I want to share those things with you, okay? If you'll excuse me. Um, who are these famous people? Let's start with Bill Gates. Bill Gates said, learning to write programs stretches your mind and it helps you to think better. It creates a way of thinking about things that I think is helpful in all domains. I agree with this 200%. Coding actually helps you to solve problems. Writing software code is actually a problem solving approach. You don't need to, in fact, the best software developers I've seen in the world that I respect did not learn computing. Some of them learn geography, some of them are zoologists. If you can, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of solving problems. You know how to create a class, an object, and you can reuse it to solve that problem, you know? People think you need to learn mathematics to learn how to code, nonsense. Unless you are doing financial applications, you don't need to know math to learn software. You know what I mean? It's just like saying, do you, need, do you need to know how to draw a map to, 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 to become a, a software developer? No, if you're going to create geographical maps, then yes, knowledge of geography is helpful. But otherwise, why do you want to learn uh, as a coder, learn how to create maps? It doesn't make sense unless that's your domain area. But in terms of solving problems, coding can help you think about problems in different ways. In fact, you get to a point where every problem you face in life, you see it in code. It's possible. You'll be dreaming in code. When somebody has to look for your trouble, you'll be thinking about how to get back at them in code or something like that. So this is what Bill Gates said. Let's think about what somebody else has said. Richard Branson, some of you may know him. He's the head of a Virgin Group. He said, whether we're fighting climate change or going to space, everything is moved forward by computers nowadays. And it's true. Everything we do today is based on computing. We're in the digital age. And so he said, and we don't have enough people who can code. So teaching young people to code early can help build skills and confidence and energize the classroom with learning by doing opportunities. It's not talking about any industry, it's just talking in general about how the younger generation, the new, the new world we live in, if people can learn how to code, it will help them solve tomorrow's problems. Because tomorrow's problem, we don't even know what it looks like. 
but we have to be prepared for it. Our coding is one of the things that can help us prepare for the digital world. It's not the only way, but it's one way. Okay. Todd Parker, who is this guy called Todd Parker? Well, he's a former US chief technology officer, which means in the US, the terms of technology, he's the chief technology officer. That's like the top dog of technology in the United States. He said, to be prepared for the demands of the 21st century and to take advantage of its opportunities, it is important, it's essential that more of our students today learn basic computer programming skills, no matter what field of work they want to pursue. Again, you can see it's neutral. It's not about whether you want to become a doctor, engineer, a farmer, a truck driver, or you want to become a goalkeeper. Whatever you want to become, coding will be helpful to you going forward. You know? So this is very, very uh, inspiring and very important. Steve Hawking, some of you know him. He's a cosmologist. He said, whether you want to uncover the secrets of the universe, or you just want to pursue a career in the 21st century, basic computer programming is an essential skill to learn. It's not a specialization that you can say, I went to university to learn coding or programming. No, everybody can learn programming. Like I said, to me, coding or programming is like English. All of us must learn English. Some of us write emails with it, some of us simply send SMS. What you do with it is up to you. Okay? Snoop Dogg, surprise, surprise. Some of you know Snoop Dogg. Yes. He said, support the American dream and make coding available to everyone. Now, if a rapper can tell you that coding is important, then what the heck are you thinking that coding is not important? Okay, again, he's not saying everybody should learn, should master coding, but it should be available to everyone. You should have the opportunity to try it out, to, to make something out of it, okay? Now, that's a rapper talking. If Snoop Dogg can say the same thing that Bill Gates and Richard Branson are saying, then, and some of you are still thinking, oh, coding is bullshit, I don't have to learn it, excuse my French, then I'm sorry, you are, in the, you are operating on a wrong wavelength. Again, I have to emphasize, I'm not trying to say all of us should become good at coding or must go and start learning coding tomorrow. No. The point of this webinar is why would you want to ever learn coding? How will it be important to you as an AC professional? And I hope that the um, explanations I've given, the examples, and some of these last quotations will hopefully inspire you to understand that, yeah, there's a place for coding in today's world, even if it's in the built environment. Okay? Um, but my favorite personal, um, sorry, my personal favorite uh, quotation is not really a quotation, it's a video. I don't want to play it because we don't have time. And even if I could have time, it's not proper that I should play somebody else's YouTube video in a webinar. But I want you all to go to YouTube and look for a guy called Christian Genko. It's a YouTube video titled, You Should Learn Programming. It's a TEDx video. Learn it and understand why it's important for every industry to have its own army of coders. And he ended up his presentation by saying, when you now finally learn how to code, don't become a software developer, please. He's begging you. He's saying, take that coding ability and come back to your domain. Come back to construction. Come back to medicine. Come back to engineering. Go back to science or sociology, whatever, and apply that coding to help your industry become better. That's a way of thinking. That's a philosophy. And it's very deep. Okay? So the point is now you don't learn how to code so that you can be competing with software developers. No. You will solve problems in your own domain if you learn how to code. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And apologies for the breaking transmission we had midway through the presentation. And I hope that um, you'll have some questions for me to answer and I'll be happy to take them. And even if they're not questions, I'm happy to have some brief conversations uh, or just exchange of ideas. But I think we should start with, uh, with questions. So um, over to you, um, if you have any questions, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this session, sir. And once again, apologies for the break in the transmission. I can see... Or if you, in case you have your questions, you can unmute your mic and ask your question. I can see on Yema raising his hand. Okay, thank you very much sir, for the presentation. It was quite an insightful one. So I have a particular question I want to ask with regards to what you mentioned during the presentation. During the presentation, you talked about how the industry is migrating towards the cloud how it started mm. from card mm. to revit mm. and now how mm. most of the tools are gradually getting a web interface like vim 360. Mm. so i also have an idea of some projects autodex is working on mm. like the project quantum yes. and even the autodex forge mm. whereby they are trying to create some web interface for these tools like revit autocad and Chrome. so mm. my question now is i know that autodex Forge technology has to do with programming as well. Mm. So if someone wants to like prepare for the future per se, like they mm -hmm. want to prepare ahead mm. and not just learning C sharp or Revit or another, mm. is it still going to be the same programming language the person will still be learning or is the Autodesk okay. port and project quantum and all that, is it going okay. to require different 
okay. programming languages and all that. I'm just thinking if the programming also has to do with the same, okay. you know, the future things that are coming up okay. in the industry. That's a, that's a very interesting question. And you're right, Forge is the underlying framework that Odus is using for all this electricity and the rest of that. And um, surprisingly, you know, I tried to avoid mentioning specific languages and I said I'll probably do that in the question and answer session. The Forge technology has many ways of being used. Mm -hmm. Originally, the Forge, Forge technology is based on a JavaScript engine. So if you want to work with Forge, if you learn JavaScript, not just JavaScript, but uh, it, uh, with a branch of JavaScript called Node.js, you will go far with Forge. It's not the easiest thing to learn Node.js, but it's something you can learn. But Forge also has a way of allowing people who do C-sharp to develop applications from C-sharp. They also have a Python interface. They also have Ruby interface. If you go to, um, what's this thing called? Uh, this repository. Um, uh, what's this repository where people put code again? I've forgotten now. Uh, GitHub. GitHub. If you go to GitHub and just search Forge API, you will see the different interfaces or the sorry different um, flavors of Forge API. Of course, Autodex has its own bias towards JavaScript because most of the examples you see will be based on you know, JS type of JavaScript approach. But they also have C sharp examples. If you go to the AU Autodex University web, um, webinars and videos online, you find some examples on uh, on C sharp. You find some examples on on JavaScript and the rest of that. So. There are many software, um, sorry, many programming languages that you can use to work with Forge. But I think because of the emphasis they're putting, and because Forge itself is based on something called 3JS. So those of you that know JavaScript have come across a library of JavaScript called 3JS. That's what Forge is based on. So you can't go wrong if you start with, uh, with JavaScript. You have to learn the basic JavaScript or what we call the vanilla JavaScript, the normal one. And then you probably have to learn a little bit of, um, uh, what do you call it, um, um, jQuery, which is a framework of JavaScript. And then you can start to learn things like Node.js, which is another way of using uh, JavaScript with the back end databases so that you can talk to the forge or, 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 or database of the models that you're working with. Um, so that's what I would say. Uh, there's no, like I said, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to do web applications, in fact, not just for forge, anybody that wants to do web applications, because everything is going to the browser now, cannot go wrong with JavaScript. JavaScript is the most powerful language of the web. It's the most powerful language of the web. It's the language of the web. In fact, it's regarded as the most popular language by some ranking systems and um because anything that works on the web and is fast and it's efficient is probably javascript driven okay i hope that answers your question any qu other question um hello can you hear me yes i can hear you yeah, um, thank you so much for a great presentation. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, but you haven't talked about the financial value of people learning code in uh, in terms of jobs and what is available in the market or what is coming in the future. Okay. Could you uh, jump into that a little bit? Okay, that's an interesting thing. But, but I made mm -hmm. reference to a mm -hmm. star or a superhero. But if you add coding, now you're not going to find a lot of jobs out there for coders. Who are construction people? You're not going to find a lot of them because the industry is just in a state of flux. We are changing, but we are recognizing the need for this sort of people. So, it's at a starting point, I would say that if you learn how to code, it can place you at a at a, you put it at a level where I said you will be um, you will be valuable for your own organization to start with. But you might end up being someone who goes to start their own um, uh, start what do you call them startup company where you can actually create something that's so useful that people will, 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 will come and subscribe to your software. Um, and, but then again, it may be that you are just going to be an architect or a civil engineer who will create certain plugins or apps that will be sold in um, Autodesk Exchange and you make your own side money from there. Do you understand what I'm saying? So there's no single, single or uh, straightforward answer to say what is the financial value. It's, 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 it's easy, but it's also a complex question to answer. Because it just gives you unique skills. And, and any skill you have will end up making you a better professional than the next first person. You know? Now, I do understand that, especially in developing countries, in Africa and other parts of the world, it will not necessarily be easy to see the value. But in places like the UK, where they're one of the leading countries in terms of digital transformation, you can just imagine how, how much people like that are valued. Okay? They actually have job adverts where they look for people who can code, but who have a bit of engineering background. In fact, they're actually even many you know, institutions now even thinking about bringing coding into their curriculum like at MSc level and the rest of it, okay? 
In fact, presently, um, I also try to develop some um, um, some personal, some online courses for this sort of thing where people can actually learn to code for the construction industry and maybe it might make its way into a formal curriculum with an MSc program in the future. I don't know for now. But um, it's like asking somebody what is the financial value of um, you know, becoming an efficient or a, a very good uh, civil engineer because that's what coding will help you. It's not going to make you a software developer. It's going to be a unique kind of civil engineer, a unique kind of quantity surveyor. It's, in, it's, it's unquantifiable. It all depends on where you find yourself. If you work for a small company, that is just a small mom and pop firm of architects and engineers, and maybe just eight employees. Maybe learning to code will not necessarily add value to your salary or to your professional life. So you might have to think about it, whether you really want that. But if you work for a large multinational company and you can code, hmm, I'd be surprised if they don't, you know, grab you and even encourage you, even give you a year of one master this thing and come back and maybe send you to their head office in, in Houston or somewhere and say, go and work for them because you are too good for us. It all depends. Okay. I hope that answers your question, please. Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Right. Any other question? Yes, I have a question. This is Lord, this is Lord Kajima. I have a question. Yes, please. Yes, um, regarding the new trends, the developing trend on uh, data science, data science now um, uh, interfacing into every industry. Um, can you give uh, just an, an overview of how this connects with coding and how construction professionals can uh, take advantage of this new discipline? Okay, that's a very good question. If I, when I was giving an example of the areas that uh, AEC professionals can specialize in, I talked about VR, plug the macros. I could have mentioned data science and um, machine learning, all this, but I didn't want to you know about complicate things. But that's a different branch of computing itself but it's also affecting every single industry you can think about, including construction. And if you want to go into data science, it's more or less you work with a lot of data for analytics or for forensic purposes or for prediction and other sort of things you know, for with big data. And um, if you wanted to go into that, uh, definitely uh, there are two, well, not two, but the two popular uh, languages you want to think about will be Python and, and a language called R. But I'll be more in favor of Python because for most people it'll be easier to learn. R is very good for statistical analysis and all those sort of things, but it might not be the most easy thing for an AC professional to learn. But again, the whole point of data science is that it is taking advantage of the fact that everything around us is becoming data driven. Everything around us generates new data, digital data, you know, sensors, um, apps, desktop applications, everybody's generating data. Some of them are even called dark data. You know, I don't know if you're aware of this, with the normal data that you see is your data that can come from a spreadsheet and you can download that and analyze it. There's a lot of dark data around, like contract documents, emails, and if you can do data science, you can analyze all those emails and extract meanings and, and, and insights into them to understand how uh, an organization can be more efficient. So, yeah, data science is an, it's a branch of, of, of coding itself. And um, it's usually something that uh, some, you can go into it directly without even being into construction. But if you know construction or built environment, then yes, you'll be a better data scientist than just any normal data scientist because all those things you are analyzing with the data analytics will make sense to you because you can probably make better inferences than somebody who doesn't know why am I seeing a pattern like this? What's going on here? You know what I mean? So that's just what I would say about uh, uh, data science. It's an important uh, ingredient in uh, digital transformation. I hope that answers your question. Any other question, please? Hello. Okay. Uh, it seems there are no more questions. Okay. Right. Um, well, thank you very much for, for your time, and I hope you find the presentation useful. And uh, as usual, if you have more questions for me, you can send them to the BIM Africa WhatsApp group, and I'll try to answer them. Thank you very much and um, have a good day. Thank you all. And once again, apologies for the glitch. We hope to get better. Do have a wonderful weekend.